As a game developer, a lot of time and effort goes into constructing an entertaining experience, balancing a number of different elements. Every inclusion needs to work together in harmony to ensure a successful product. After releasing this culmination of hard work, the best news to get back is that the game has been well received. Thanks to this endeavor, the developer now has more money, resources, and support than ever before. This is where an important decision needs to be made. In short, what's the next step? The developer could simply keep this game as a one-off, riding the wave of success while working on something else. They could also choose to be satisfied where they are, enjoying the fruits of their labor. If there are still ideas worth exploring, making a sequel is another option. However, there are pros and cons that come with this decision. Depending on how you structure it, this next entry could satisfy fans or turn them against you. Do you play it safe? Do you venture into new territory? Or do you attempt to compromise? Welcome to Corpse Party, Book of Shadows. Corpse Party is a series of indie horror games that initially started back in 1996 in Japan. After a lot of development, the West finally saw the official release of Blood Covered in 2012. Marking the starting point of the series, it wouldn't take long before the popularity resulted in various other entries being made. For a long time, the first game was the only frame of reference I had for the entire series. More recently, curiosity took over, making me wonder if the other offerings were worthwhile. At this point, I'm glad to say that I've experienced nearly everything Corpse Party has to offer, minus the movies and a game or two. With my previous surface level knowledge, I could only use critic and player reviews to gauge the overall reception, essentially being a downward slope of quality. Knowing what I do now, I'd say a lot is worth checking out. In particular, a few parts do an exceptional job of building on the groundwork laid by Blood Covered. One of these just so happens to be a direct sequel with a manga version to match. The next entry we'll be looking at is Corpse Party Book of Shadows, adapted from the second game in the series. Consisting of three volumes total, the manga began production roughly two months after the game's release in 2011, being completed in 2014. As far as the game is concerned, the overall presentation is a bit different from Blood Covered. While the original was a free roaming horror adventure game, Book of Shadows has completely transitioned into a visual novel. Though it may be less of a game now, it honestly feels appropriate for this kind of experience. Where general movement gave you slightly more control over your fate in the first game, here, the removal of full control makes the journey slightly more unsettling. This is especially true during exploration. Using a small map to move across the different areas, you get an up-close view of the oppressive surroundings. Navigating around with a small cursor, each location can be explored through a limited search mode. Finding certain objects can prove useful, but examining other items may increase your level of darkening. If this builds all the way up, your journey comes to a premature end. Much like the first game, you can also mess up if you explore certain places out of order, or make incorrect choices, leading to a gruesome finale. This is just my subjective opinion, but the wrong ends in this game feel even more brutal than the original. The violence was always relatively extreme, but here, Sachiko is front and center, putting the characters through various forms of torture. One ending in particular that will haunt me forever involves a certain female student. Captured by the sadistic spirit, she has her skin flayed while still alive. This gets even worse when you find out that the game uses binaural 3D audio. Basically, using the same techniques as ASMR, some of these encounters can really fuck you up. <laughs> Add another well-made soundtrack, as well as exceptional voice acting into the mix, and Book of Shadows ends up being a pretty satisfying experience, at least for me personally. The story content is a bit unique, in that it's broken up into eight chapters taking place at different times. The developers describe this game as a sequel, prequel, midquel, an alternate universe tale all in one. Focusing on different characters in each part, we're introduced to new faces while learning more about familiar ones. As far as the manga adaptation is concerned, it mostly stays true to the game, expanding some story beats while others lose important context. Each section of the visual novel is generally broken into groups of three to four chapters, with a few exceptions. There are also extra chapters sprinkled in here and there, giving additional visuals to previously minimalistic scenes. The art itself 
itself is pretty good on the whole, with the characters having a cuter appearance than what we're used to. This feels especially true for Sachiko, looking far less sinister overall. Depending on your preference, this aspect could make the experience better or worse. Something I do feel is a bit detrimental is the return of a certain questionable element. More specifically, the theme of weak bladders carried over from the first game, now complete with artistic representation. Someone in the comments in my last Corpse Party video mentioned that this is actually its own fetish. While I can't say I'm familiar with that one, it would certainly make sense, especially now that two characters have the same issue. Granted, compared to certain other entries in the series, the fan service here is definitely on the lighter side. Shifting focus, the chapters also don't follow the structure laid out by the game. The order can be questionable, especially the final blood drive arc, which gets split up across the three volumes. Personally, I think I prefer this particular story as an epilogue, as it makes for a nice lead up to the final game, though given what they do with that game almost makes it pointless. With all of that said, I'll be breaking down each section of the game and noting differences between the mediums along the way. As this entry follows the events of the original, that prior knowledge will help quite a bit going forward. If you need a refresher, I'll have my previous breakdown linked as a card for your convenience. Starting just after the events of the first game, the opening shows Naomi's mother attempting to talk to her mentally scarred daughter. This scene would later go on to be used at the end of the Tortured Souls anime, as well as the prologue of the manga. Refusing to let go of the events from Heavenly Host, the girl has changed for the worst, viewed as crazy by the parent who's fed up with their antics. Moving into Chapter 1, we're reintroduced to Naomi, currently experiencing a sense of deja vu. Interrupting her thoughts, the late Seiko makes another appearance. The two girls are having a sleepover in Naomi's house, planning on heading to school together the next day. From here, we watch the friends hang out through the night, with Naomi secretly hoping these good times will continue on throughout their lives. Experiencing a number of antics while bathing together, a noteworthy mark is discovered on Seiko's neck. Writing it off as a coincidence, the girls eventually get ready for bed. Thinking about a number of things, Naomi is very much aware of the closeness shared between the two of them. However, she doesn't consider this relationship relationship to be anything more than platonic, knowing Seiko probably feels the same. Affirming the bond for herself, Seiko also wants to stay by Naomi's side. Waking up the next day, the girls head to school, immediately getting wrapped up in the cultural festival. Afterwards, the proceedings follow the first game, with the group of friends coming together to perform the Sachiko Ever After charm. This is where we see the first notable difference between the two versions. In both iterations, Satoshi interjects, saying that they shouldn't go through with the charm. In the manga, a single panel shows his objection, losing the impact of his refusal. In the game, rather than being scared, Satoshi is far more confident in trying to convince his friends. Attempting to stop them three times, he makes a real effort to prevent the ritual. This is an interesting piece of lore, because unlike Naomi's vague sense of deja vu, Satoshi's is crystal clear, to the point of him supposedly experiencing a Groundhog Day type phenomenon. It's anyone's guess as to how many loops he's gone through at this point but it seems the results are the same. The others get ready to start, forcing Satoshi to join in. The next scene skips ahead of the first game's initial warp point, starting just after Naomi breaks out of the infirmary. Reuniting with Seiko, the same argument happens again, with Naomi unreasonably pushing her friend away. This time around, the agitated girl realizes what's about to happen, and what the end result will be. Attempting to apologize, Naomi suddenly finds herself choking, keeping her from saying the ever-important words. Saddened by this development, Seiko decides to head elsewhere by herself. Shortly after, Naomi discovers endless strings of hair stuck in her throat, being the cause of her silence. Exploring the different areas of the school, Naomi eventually notices a strange obstacle in her path. Discovering a web of highly sharpened piano wire, the girl is grateful she had been paying attention. Later discovering a switch to disable the trap, Naomi makes her way to the other end of the school. Taking note of another wire at the base of the nearby staircase, the high schooler carefully heads up to the third floor. Hearing a familiar noise coming from inside the girl's bathroom, Naomi's sense of deja vu gives her an ominous feeling. Approaching the noisy stall door, the girl steals herself, pulling it open. Finding an empty noose, Naomi feels her nervousness melt away. Noticing a breeze blowing against the door, she quickly locates a hidden tunnel in the back wall, with a single ladder going down. Being thorough, the girl begins her descent, not wanting to overlook the possibility of her friend being at the bottom. The manga unfortunately jumps past the earlier development, 
elements, moving from the web of piano wire straight to the ladder climb, heading most of the way down. Now, Mi accidentally loses her footing on the slippery rungs. Landing safely, the girl examines the small muddy cave around her, not containing much of anything. Ready to head to the surface, she's hindered by a surge of pain coming from her ankle. Saving herself on the way down, her previously injured foot took most of the abuse. Not having the strength or balance to climb on one foot, now Mi has effectively become trapped in the underground hole. Trying countless times, the girl is eventually forced to accept her tragic circumstances. Before she gives into despair, a young child appears before her, telling Naomi not to give up. Being told the girl can see her friend again, the high schooler is willing to do anything this being wants to make it happen. Pleased by this answer, the cruel spirit briefly gives herself away. Shifting over to the missing person, Seiko is still wandering the halls, regretting the fight from earlier. Suddenly, Naomi appears next to her, finally able to apologize properly. The friends reconcile, changing the fate of the formerly deceased girl. Moving to the nearby custodian's room, the two discuss a variety of topics, forgetting their grim surroundings for the time being. Gradually, Seiko's expression changes, going on to ask her friend an important question. Hesitating at first, the girl manages to collect herself, wanting to properly convey her feelings. Looking Naomi dead in the eye, Seiko requests a kiss. Shocked by her words, Seiko continues by fully revealing her affection. This scene plays out differently depending on which version you choose. After the game's confession, Naomi freezes up, proceeding to quickly leave the room to get some distance. The manga arguably handles this better, with Naomi conducting herself appropriately, going on to calmly stand outside the door to collect her thoughts. Shortly after, a strange black liquid leaks out of Naomi's body. As a wave of pain washes over her, the girl eventually loses consciousness. In a game-exclusive transition, Sachiko warns the high schooler about her upcoming destination. Waking up in a new location, Naomi immediately recognizes her surroundings. Going into the familiar house, another game-specific scene shows a younger Naomi receiving a cat from her parents. Constantly busy with work, they're hopeful that the new friend will be enough to keep their daughter happy. Unfortunately, this only works for so long, as the small girl continues to be lonely at home. Much like her fight with Seiko, Naomi gets angry at the pet, blaming it for her problems. Having a similar outcome, the cat disappears, leaving the child alone like she wanted. Eventually, the flashback ends, and Naomi finds an apparition of Seiko sitting in the dining room. Not saying anything at first, the other girl gradually starts talking with an accusatory tone. Interrupting the conversation, Sachiko wants to know if Naomi is willing to go all the way for her friend. Claiming to be in charge of this dimension, the high schooler feels that she might be able to trust the spirit that's been guiding her. With determination, Naomi pleads for a chance to make things right. Confirming that the sense of deja vu isn't just coincidence, the young girl instructs the desperate teen to fight against her friend's predetermined death. Outside of the flashback, there's another interesting minor change worth noting. In the manga, Sachiko behaves like an actual kid, worried for Naomi with a concerned expression. In the game, Sachiko toys with Naomi, pretending to be Seiko and chastising the friend for her actions. Regardless of the approach, both are equally cruel in their own way. Being warped back to Heavenly Host, Naomi now finds herself on the third floor, standing just outside of the girl's bathroom. Hearing another loud noise coming from inside, the high school once again enters to determine the cause. Opening the stall door, this time, Seiko is found helplessly dangling from the previously empty noose. Recalling the previous solution she tried, Naomi now knows that using the bucket outside, as well as grabbing Seiko's body in any way, will result in death. Instead, the girl puts herself underneath Seiko, using her frame to lift the friend higher. Guiding the limp body to the back wall, this allows Naomi to untie the rope, while also giving Seiko the chance to breathe. Helping her to the ground, Naomi marvels at her success. Against all odds, she actually managed to save Seiko. Frustrated with her friend's suicidal action, Naomi doesn't remember that it was her who put the girl there in the first place. Very much aware, Seiko erupts into a fit of screaming, quickly running out of the bathroom, away from her attacker. Confused, Naomi chases her down the stairs, coming to a stop as she witnesses a gruesome sight at the bottom. Not seeing the single sharp wire that was waiting near the final step, Seiko's neck came in contact, not giving any resistance to the clean cut. Fully expecting this turn of events, Sachiko appears to rub salt in the wound, dropping her facade of kindness. Revealing an awful truth, Naomi finds out that there was no chance of saving her to begin with. Not only that, but attempting to fight against that fate might lead to a more painful death. 
In this light, Naomi caused just that, with Seiko having her demise extended further. Trapped in the hellish school, it's only a matter of time before she's forced to experience it again. Before I move on, this ending section actually loses some interesting context in the manga. Instead of the build-up outside of the bathroom, Naomi is instantly shown in front of Seiko after talking with Sachiko. Running downstairs, Seiko gets killed by the same wire, but here, there's a problem. Without knowledge of the game, there's no way of telling where this wire is strung up, or why it's such a good scene in general. When you first see that wire at the bottom of the stairs, it looks far less opposing than the web you encountered before. While deadly in its own right, there's no reason that it can't be avoided, thus making it an afterthought. It completely disappears from memory until Seiko makes a beeline for the stairs later on. Reading through the text, you're eventually met with a certain sound effect. You're then left with roughly 10 painful seconds of nothing but footsteps, until Naomi sees her friend again. I don't know about anyone else, but after hearing the body collapse downstairs, a sense of dread washed over me. When I briefly questioned what could have happened, I immediately remembered the unsuspecting wire from before, and sure enough, it did its job. The setup for failure is so well done here, and it's a shame that none of this gets carried over to the manga. Still, with limited pages, you can only convey so much. There's also the fact that Sachiko's taunting at the end is lessened in the manga, being reduced to a background element. The game shows her acting more cruel, laughing in the face of her helpless victim. <laughs> These changes aside, the manga is doing decently enough despite the faster pace, but what about the next part? Chapter 2 of the game opens on Mayu, recovering after being aggressively flung out of the infirmary of Heavenly Host. It doesn't take long for the ones responsible to make an appearance, ready to inflict more damage. Lifting the girl into the air, the spirits rush down the hall, smashing her body against the wall at the end. Mayu is left to writhe in pain, until she wakes up from what turned out to be a bad dream. Confused by her surroundings, the girl calls out for her classmates, only to be met with silence. Suddenly, Mayu notices the same child's spirits from her dream heading into the infirmary nearby. Having a deadly premonition, the game only gives a single prompt, perfectly in line with the girl's thoughts. Given the chance to actually explore the school, Mayu gets her first dose of what everyone else has already experienced. Eventually discovering one of the signature candles of her classmate, the high schooler knows she's on the right track. Finding the entranceway locked, she narrowly avoids the appearance of one of the child's spirits. Making her way to classroom 1A on the second floor, the girl manages to locate the original draw point of Naomi and Seiko, as well as a key that looks to be somewhat important. Finding a few dropped articles as she goes, Mayu learns of a betrayal between deceased friends, adding a new level of unease to her situation. Checking other areas of the school, she's caught off guard as Morishige's voice calls out to her from somewhere in the distance. Running after the source, Mayu desperately searches around, but has no luck in finding her friend. Putting a hold on this, a violent earthquake shakes the school, unexpectedly modifying her surroundings. Using her memories as a coping mechanism, we're shown a flashback of a conversation with Morishige. This is where the manga starts Mayu's story, cutting out all of the previous moments that give her an adjustment period in Heavenly Host. To the manga's credit, I think it does a better job of establishing her previous standing in class. The game's flashback appears to take place in the drama club room, with Mayu and Morishige discussing an issue they're having with planning a certain performance. Morishige wants to take action, making Mayu glad that she has someone she can rely on. This is further emphasized as she mentions all the responsibility she has being the club's poster girl. Admiring her strength, Morishige talks about his observations of her character. Reminded of her ability to persevere, this helps the current Mayu to carry on, if only slightly. The manga shows her talents firsthand, displaying a costume meant to be worn during the upcoming cultural festival. This also references the same outfit seen earlier in Naomi and Seiko's chapter. We also see the entire class being enthusiastic about the work, along with them being aware of her achievements. She's even relied on by other club members, wanting her advice on how to deal with certain situations. Being her right-hand man, Morishige does his best to make sure that Mayu doesn't become overwhelmed. Regardless, she remains positive, taking the requests of others into consideration. In this instance, Mayu comes across as the most popular person in the class, acknowledged by everyone around her. Morishige also goes further here, talking about her actions in the past and how they reflect positively on who 
she is. Again mentioning her sense of tenacity, things end off on a slightly more romantic note. Showing other interactions between the main characters, this feels like the best representation of their former school life, especially since we don't get many chances to see that. Returning to the present, Mayu becomes discouraged, knowing she isn't as strong as others perceive her to be. Not good at dealing with tense conditions, she feels that her positivity is more of a mask, worn by the girl full of anxiety. Appearing in front of her, Yoshiki's arrival immediately snaps her out of these thoughts. Glad to see each other, Yoshiki quickly explains his search for the currently missing Shinozaki. Initially in the locker room by the pool, the young man searched outside, noticing an item submerged underwater. Needing a key for the neighboring pump room, the two decide to backtrack, rationalizing that the recent earthquake may have opened up new areas. Making their way to a seemingly familiar classroom, the duo runs into the same situation they faced previously. Nevertheless, Yoshiki hits the switch near the back, opening a hidden room further down the hall. Finding a small chest inside, the teen decides to bring it with him. Calling attention to herself, Shinozaki starts chanting and yelling at random, now possessed by a lingering spirit. Not sticking around, the girl quickly runs off to an unknown destination. Before he can chase after her, Yoshiki is stopped by a certain strange girl. Trying to leave, the young man is convinced to stay, as Naho apparently has something important to say. Able to take in the remnants of broken minds around the school, Shinozaki seemingly has quite a paranormal gift. Unfortunately, she also has no way to control this, with the potential of soul erasure being possible. Leaving it up to him to figure out, Naho takes off, refusing to clarify further. All caught up now, the two students set off to find their missing friends. Needing a bathroom break, the duo heads up to the third floor to take care of business. Before she can, Mayu notices an odd bruise spreading across her stomach. Too embarrassed to say anything about it, the girl decides to keep it to herself for the time being. Exhausting their search options, the teens make their way back to the pool locker room, only to find another girl tied up with medical bandages. During her initial observation, Mayu notices that this person has strange marks on her legs, similar in nature to the one on her stomach. Putting this aside for now, the two realize that the bandages are wrapped around countless objects in the room, leading to a metal bucket hanging precariously above the girl. Touching anything is dangerous, but the victim's thrashing will eventually result in her demise regardless. Opting to calm her down before anything else, Mayu manages to keep things under control. Freeing the girl shortly after, the two high schoolers are introduced to Nana, a middle schooler from a completely different area. Bonding outside, the two girls clean themselves in the rain, regrouping with Yoshiki to begin searching again. Along the way, the group notices a shiny object at the bottom of a hole in the floor. Using the bandages from the earlier trap, Mayu bravely takes one for the team, descending to the level below with the makeshift rope. Finding herself in an area surrounded by dead bodies, the girl locates a bottle with some kind of fluid inside. Quickly returning to the surface, it's discovered that the container is carrying holy water. Not particularly useful in the moment, the item later gets its chance to shine when the trio encounters a group of vengeful spirits. One of the remaining apparitions attacks the students, with Yoshiki stepping in to take the damage for himself. As Mayu offers a bandage to him, she notices that her student ID is missing, not boding well for the girl who previously escaped death. Remembering the key she found earlier, Mayu uses it to unlock the small chest that Yoshiki had been holding onto. Turning out to be a music box, the group finds another key hiding inside, giving them access to a new area. While it's minor, the manga simply has Nana present the unlocked box to Mayu while they're talking outside by the pool. Unlocking the third floor reference room, the group finally locates Shinozaki, who's currently mumbling nonsense to herself. Yoshiki demands the possessor to leave the girl's body, but finds that multiple spirits have a hold on her. Wanting to keep the living person for themselves, the apparitions are harshly refused by the angry teen in front of them. Not taken kindly to this development, Shinozaki is forced into a more violent state, with Yoshiki as her target. As she quickly bites into his neck, the other two girls try to intervene, but Yoshiki is determined to handle things. Hugging her close, the young man pleads with Shinozaki to regain her senses. His voice manages to reach her, breaking her free from the trance. Regaining their bearings, the new goal is to get to the bottom of what's going on at the school, find the rest of their friends, and figure out a way to leave. Checking over some articles nearby, the group learns about the initial murder case presented in the first game. Being exhausted after the day's proceedings, everyone decides to camp out in a section of the second floor hallway. Yoshiki and Shinozaki pass 
out immediately, leaving the other two girls to chat for a bit. Mayu then takes notice of the scars on Nana's legs, as they've gotten considerably darker since their first encounter. Brushing this off, they continue talking, until Nana eventually gets up to do a bit of additional exploring. Not sleeping as deeply as they thought, Yoshiki overheard the previous conversation, encouraging Mayu to go after her. Trying the nearby bathroom, Mayu's surge comes up empty. Coming back to the hall, Nana's voice screams out in a panic. Heading to the scene, Mayu finds the grisly sight of Nana on the floor with her legs cut off. Understandably shocked, Mayu can only silently watch her friend writhe in pain. Sensing another person coming towards them, Mayu finally sees the possessed teacher from Blood Covered. The man grabs Nana, dragging her towards the room behind him. The game alludes that his grip was more like a bite, and I suppose the manga decided to take that literally, because during the same scene, he actually uses his mouth to drag Nana back. Disappearing through the door, Mayu attempts to chase after them, but gets blocked by the school itself. Unable to help the dying girl on the other side, Mayu panics and runs away. This part marks the beginning of the end, and there are a few significant changes between the two mediums. The game's events continue in the hallway, with Mayu realizing that Nana's legs were severed where her scars used to be. Checking the bruise on her stomach, she discovers that her own situation has taken a turn for the worse. Noticing another mark on her face, the girl becomes far more unsettled, knowing what might be in her future. Hearing her cry out, the other two run over, worried about their friend as well as Nana's whereabouts. Offering their help, Mayu denies it, nervous that they'll find out about her secret. Running away to the infirmary, the high schooler uses some makeup to cover the small blemish. Fixing one problem, she's now faced with another. Finding the exit door locked with endless strands of hair, Mayu then feels someone else in the room with her. Meeting the gaze of Sanchiko, the young girl is ready to use a certain person to decorate the room. As the child spirits make an appearance, Mayu recalls her premonition, though at this point, she's far too late. Taunting her, Sachiko wants the high schooler to look at her face one more time. Doing this, Mayu is shocked to see the recently covered bruise now splitting open. Reiterating an earlier point, Sachiko declares that Mayu will suffer a more painful death from prolonging the inevitable. With the scar on her stomach following suit, the girl knows that nothing can be done to prevent this. Holding her down, the children slowly and methodically remove Mayu's entrails. Experiencing an insufferable amount of pain, she eventually grows cold, passing on shortly after. Hoping Morishige won't be disgusted by her appearance, her final wish is for him to be the one to find her body. The manga has a much more direct approach, combining the true ending with the wrong end. That said, there's a noteworthy difference that results because of this. The final death scene gets split between the first and last chapters of this arc. The initial starting point opens on a flashback of Blood Covered, showing the earliest performance of the charm ritual. This is immediately followed by Mayu getting pinned down in the hallway by the child spirits. In the game, this particular wrong end has Mayu nearly choked to death, bent all the way back in spine-crushing fashion, and finally pulled apart by her legs. The manga slightly changes this, with her being choked, having fingers broken off, getting teeth ripped out, and then pulling her legs apart. Basically, if you've seen Blood Sea, you know what to expect here. Yoshiki and Shinozaki are also seen locked behind the hall doors, doing their best to get to Mayu. Yoshiki in particular furiously attempts to break through, but to no avail. This scene in particular is interesting, because during the game's version of this death, the other two students never show up. It's also worth mentioning that this event is a flashback that Shinozaki has during the scattered chapters of the manga's final arc. Setting the stage, the real Mayu section starts after the brutal record collection. Fast forwarding to the end, Mayu is again running away out of fear. However, rather than being self-conscious about the bruises, she feels worse about the fact that she couldn't do anything to save Nana. The other two never check on Mayu, leaving her to head to the infirmary right away. Not good in serious situations, she reflects on the fact that she isn't as strong as people think. Being an actor in school, she applied this to her life as well. While the previous scene had Sachiko talking a decent amount, here, she has no dialogue, outside of an eerie message left for Mayu. The bruises are barely mentioned, with the spirits now wasting time and beginning their assault. Finishing the gruesome act, Morishige is later seen coming across the aftermath. Led to the crucified remains of Mayu's body, the chapter ends where another arc begins. Personally, I think this section of the adaptation is more impactful overall, and not just because of the imagery. The unique scenes showing Mayu's characterization shed more light on who she is as a person, and I appreciate the development. She's not just an NPC anymore, but a girl with dreams and problems of her own. 
Regardless, I think this series of chapters fared better compared to the previous ones. That said, there's also a side story that gives some unfortunate closure to the friends Nana was searching for. This is another chapter that joins separate endings together, but this time, it's three wrong ends. The focus now lies on the other girls, going by Nari and Chihaya. For a bit of context, I'll explain what leads up to these events. After using the holy water on the spirits, Yoshiki looks through a certain notebook that Mayu found earlier. Noticing a certain drawing inside, he claims it is similar to the chest he's carrying, leading them to unlock it to find the next key. If you don't find the notebook, this results in a certain pathway being cut off, as well as the spirits never appearing. Going upstairs to the room Shinozaki's in, the group tries the key they have, learning that it doesn't work. Yoshiki then tries to scrape the rust off of it to make it fit, leading them to discover what the key actually goes to. With the science lab being on the other side of the inaccessible hallway, the group uses the bandages from Nana's trap to make a rope going across the gap. Yoshiki jumps across to secure it, with Mayu climbing over next, leaving Nana to bring up the rear. Unfortunately, the possessed teacher makes an early appearance, heading straight towards the lone girl. With insane strength, the man uses his hammer to cut through the rope, as well as completely remove Nana's legs while she was still hanging. Pulling her up, the other two use the bandages to stop the bleeding as best they can. With the girl passed out, the duo was desperate to find some kind of fix in a nearby room. Having barely any time to react, the students are dumbfounded at seeing their attacker reappear. Unable to clear the hole in the floor, the man used the secret tunnel in the girl's bathroom to catch back up. From this point, a timer appears overhead, leaving the player to make a decision. If you choose to go to the infirmary, the door is locked, as Sachiko is busy torturing Chihaya. After the time runs out, Nana and Yoshiki get slaughtered, leaving Mayu alone with Sachiko and the child spirits. Going back a bit, you can also choose to go into the science lab. Locking the door behind them, the students are safe for the time being, causing the timer to disappear. Looking around the room, they discover another student who had been killed more recently. Checking her ID, the deceased girl just so happens to be Nari. Regaining consciousness in time to hear this, Nana is devastated by the news. Making things worse, the possessed teacher breaks down the door like it's nothing, with Sachiko entering behind him. Bringing a severed head with her, Nana identifies this person to be Chihaya, who just recently met her demise in the infirmary. Putting her hand inside the girl's neck, Sachiko uses the head as a puppet, taunting the friend who's forced to watch. Losing too much blood, Nana finally fades away, leaving the other two alone with a psychotic spirit. Skipping ahead to a wrong end in chapter 5, another girl named Mitsuki gets captured by Sachiko's mindless accomplice. Brought to the science lab, she becomes a witness to Nari's death, watching the poor girl get boiled alive. Sachiko then sets her sights on Mitsuki, ready to do the same thing to her. Going back to the manga, Chihaya is the one who wakes up to find Nari instead of Mitsuki. Fully aware that something terrible is coming, Nari again says her final words, but with her friend actually being present for them this time. The talking head portion has also been reversed, with Nana's head being used instead of Chihaya's. With no one left to save her, the only way out for Chihaya is getting burned to a crisp. While certainly brutal, it's interesting seeing all of these separate parts come together like this. It honestly works quite well keeping the scene focused on the friends. As a complete package, I'd say Chapter 2 was adapted quite well despite a few changes. That said, let's move on to the next part. Chapter 3 opens on Satoshi making a trip to Miss Yui's apartment, as the teacher is currently under the weather. Bringing some documents with him, the teen plans to make a quick delivery, then head home to spend time with his sister. Not getting a response from the doorbell, Satoshi discovers that the door isn't actually locked, going inside out of concern. Attempting to leave a note for her, the young man looks up to find his teacher staring at him in a daze. Very much out of sorts, Miss Yui mistakes the person in front of her for someone named Tsukasa. Bringing her back to bed, Satoshi does his best to take care of the sick woman. Falling into a deep sleep, Miss Yui has a flashback to her time in high school. Returning to the conversation topic at hand, her group of friends is in the middle of thinking about the future. The only one with a clear direction is Yui, aiming to get into university to become a teacher. Doing some chores around the school one day, it's here that we're introduced to the previously mentioned Tsukasa. Struggling with some heavy trash, the boy takes it upon himself to help her with the load. Thanking him with a drink, the 
The two share a nice moment together in the nearby courtyard. The days continue on, with the duo later meeting up in the same spot on multiple occasions. Over the course of many conversations, Yui realizes how different Tsukasa is, appreciating his relaxed demeanor. As the year moves into autumn, the girl receives some amazing news in regards to her career path, telling a friend of hers, Yui's cheerfulness has apparently gotten old, as the other girl continues to struggle with her decision. Feeling guilty about lashing out, the friend quickly apologizes, with Yui ensuring her that it's no big deal. However, this encounter causes her to have a painful realization. Ashamed of her prideful attitude, Yui wonders if someone like her would be able to properly fill the role of an educator. Being caught by Tsukasa in the hall, the girl attempts to cover up the situation by underplaying the conflict, claiming her tears to be positive. Going on to mention her recommendation, she quickly stops herself mid-sentence, not wanting to repeat the same experience that just happened. Expecting another wave of disgust, she's instead met with congratulations. Comforted by Tsukasa, Yui manages to get back on her feet. Being given a small pencil, the boy guarantees success on her entrance exam if she uses it. Revealing that he knew why she was actually crying, Tsukasa flips this to offer encouragement. Grateful for his kind words, Yui starts to fall in love with him. Moving to the day before her entrance exam, Yui finds an older woman collapsed outside of her house. Strangely, this person is adamant that the young girl should stay away from school today. Having her warning refused, the woman then gives Yui a paper charm to keep her safe. Denying this, the young girl is met with a wave of desperation. The stranger pleads with the teen, not wanting her to go to a certain other deadly school. Losing her strength, the woman again falls to the ground, with an ambulance taking her away shortly after. Heading to class, Yui relays what happened to her, resulting in a friend's interest being piqued at the mention of Heavenly Host. Apparently, the school in question used to be located where their building currently stands. Mentioning a story known as Yoshie After School, the girl talks about the death of Sachiko's mom, occurring on a day that matches similar current conditions. Keeping this in mind, Yui walks home with Tsukasa by her side. Shaken by the events earlier that day, it doesn't help when Tsukasa laughs off the urban legend. Not appreciating his approach to the situation, Yui becomes aggravated. Tsukasa offers his help before she leaves, but gets met with silence. Arriving home, Yui is told that the older woman passed away in the hospital, with her mother attempting to keep her daughter from thinking about the ordeal. Constantly looping the previous encounter in her mind, Yui eventually can't take the strain, briefly falling asleep. Waking up a little later, the girl goes over the article she'll need for her exam, discovering that her pen case is still at school. Despite the argument she had with Tsukasa, his pencil is still special to her, and she wants to have it ready. Returning to the school, Yui is again reminded of Yoshie, as the time is now dangerously close to matching this story. Making her way to the classroom, it doesn't take long to locate the missing item. Before heading out, the young woman decides to indulge herself a bit, standing at the podium while thinking about her future. Suddenly, the room goes dark, making it nearly impossible not to think the worst. Watching a lightning strike reveal the new interior, those thoughts are solidified, with the old woman's warning impossible to push away now. Attempting to leave, she finds the door frozen in place. Noticing a light, the girl calls out who she thinks is a custodian. As they approach, Yui realizes that the figure's movement is anything but natural. Deciding to hide under the teacher's podium, the young woman eventually hears the irregular footsteps come to a stop just outside. After a bit of time passes, Yui peeks out to check her surroundings. While the apparition had seemingly disappeared, it quickly returns to torment the room's occupant. Going further, the stranger can be heard opening the door, but as Yui looks again, she finds that nothing has changed. However, as the girl decides to make a break for it, she's stopped by the older woman who had passed away, peering down accusingly at the student that hasn't gone home. Rushing to the door, Yui stops herself, now seeing the spirit on the other side. Choosing to run out the back door instead, the young woman takes a nearby item with her beforehand. Running down the hall, it doesn't take long before the attacker catches up. Using a bag of salt, Yui manages to buy herself a bit of time, dashing back to the front of the school. Unfortunately, this exit also refuses to open. Grabbing the umbrella she stashed by the entrance, Yui frantically smashes the handle against the glass 
portion of the doors. Managing to break one of the bottom panels, the girl finally acquires her freedom, at least for a few seconds, until Yoshie makes an appearance, gripping Yui's arm with tremendous force. It feels like only a matter of time before it snaps in two. Saved at the last minute, Tsukasa jumps onto the scene, freeing Yui from Yoshie's clutches. Ducking into a different classroom, Yui confirms just how serious her injury is, telling the girl he'll keep her safe no matter what. Tsukasa wants to get her to the nurse's office to treat the wound. Unsurprisingly, this plan gets thwarted as Yoshie returns to block them. Claiming to have a secret weapon, Tsukasa is ready to draw the spirit's attention while Yui runs away. Running in the opposite direction, the boy successfully becomes a decoy, giving his friend the chance to escape. Not seeing him make any other moves, Yui realizes that Tsukasa plans to sacrifice himself. Yelling out to the spirit, Yoshie changes her mark, fixating on the young woman. Grasping Tsukasa's pencil, Yui tries to appeal to the former educator's feelings, thinking she won't harm someone else aiming to be a teacher. Stating that she doesn't need a replacement, Yoshie lifts the foolish girl into the air. Thinking she's done for, Yui then watches the older woman envelop Sachiko's mother in a flash of light. As both apparitions disappear together, the airborne student falls back to the ground. Understandably exhausted from this experience, Yui loses consciousness for the time being. Waking up a bit later, Yui is surprised to see Tsukasa looking down at her. Fully regaining herself, the surroundings reveal that she's been taken to the nurse's office to recover. Oddly, the young man claims to have found her passed out in front of the school. Confused by this, Yui remembers the condition of her arm, only to find that the injury is completely absent. Explaining his presence, the concerned friend wanted to make sure she was alright after their argument, eventually winding up here. Almost convinced the entire thing was actually a dream, Yui checks her pockets, finding the pen case inside. The student apparently made it to her classroom, adding more doubt to the situation. Putting these thoughts aside for the moment, Yui realizes that her important exam is now only four hours away. With the girl breaking down into tears, Tsukasa does his best to lift her spirits. Heading to the outside walkway, the duo watches the sunrise from the boy's favorite spot. Despite Tsukasa not picking up on the girl's feelings, Yui knows that she's very much in love with them now. Apologizing for the fight they had previously, Tsukasa had already put it out of his mind a long time ago. Noticing a strange mark on Yui's arm, it ends up being a bruise, appearing in the same location that Yoshie had grabbed the girl earlier. Asking to hold hands, Yui ends the morning with a special memory. Coming back to the present, the sick woman finds Satoshi sitting next to her. Thanks to the efforts of her student, the teacher is doing considerably better than she was earlier. Satoshi brings up supplies that were left near the front door, and with neither person being responsible for buying the items, it's implied that a certain love interest left them there. Thanks to the woman talking in her sleep, Satoshi is now fully aware of the man in question. While the chapter ends on a happy note, it's only a matter of time before disaster strikes, as the bruise from Miss Yui's past reappears to serve as foreshadowing for what's to come. Unlike the other parts of the manga, this particular section of the game only takes up a single chapter. The opening is a lot more concise, only taking two pages before moving into the flashback. Personally, I feel this is just fine, especially considering how long it gets dragged out in the other version. However, a large amount of Miss Yui's development is noticeably cut, skipping ahead to the day she receives the pencil from Tsukasa. It's also implied that she already knows him, not showing their initial meeting or any of the other days they spend together. After receiving the gift, Yui's friend immediately tells the story of Yoshie after school completely unprompted, rather than it coming up as a related talking point. The very next scene shows Yui at home, noticing that Tsukasa's pencil has gone missing. As there's no chance for development between the characters, the pencil's importance is far lessened, and the fight that took place earlier in the day is absent as well. Leaving to get the item from school, this is where Yui encounters the strange woman. Only committing a single page to their meeting, the girl quickly leaves the stranger behind to avoid wasting time. The next event is somewhat similar, with the bloody classroom making another appearance after the blackout. Keeping things moving, Yui is able to open the door right away. Yoshie also appears instantly, chasing the terrified girl down the hall. Running away, Yui finds herself at the outside walkway. Ordinarily, this is where you end up if you choose not to break the glass at the front of the school. Climbing over the ledge, the student makes an attempt to hide. This goes about as well as you might expect as Yui is grabbed shortly after. From here, the game offers two decisions, but both come as a result of the girl jumping off the walkway to free herself. Depending on the choice, this actually has the potential to work out. Wishing on the pencil ultimately does nothing, leaving Yui to fall to her death. Reaching her hands out instead,
Instead, she's saved by Tsukasa, who pulls her back up to safety. The game moves on from this event, looping it back into the correct ending. The manga takes a slightly different approach, mixing parts of the true ending with an original one. Yoshie starts to choke Tsukasa, leaving both students in a precarious situation. Yui again tries to appeal to the ghostly teacher, being met with the same response. Interrupting the aggressor, the old woman from before joins everyone outside. Disappearing in the same flash of light, both women leave the students to recover. I got curious and checked the wiki to see who exactly this old lady is, and apparently she's Makina Shinozaki. This was revealed in Sweet Sachiko's hysteric birthday bash, and you also visit the woman's former residence in Blood Drive. The rest of the chapter is essentially the same, but after Yui wakes up, Satoshi actually calls attention to the bruise on her arm. The final page shows the individual deaths of Satoshi and Yui, with each panel referencing their own respective wrong ends from the first game. Overall, this part of the adaptation is a bit of a mess, rushing through the events at a breakneck speed. Regardless, not much else could be done here, and we still have plenty more to check out. Chapter 4 opens on a girl named Sayaka, currently being dragged by the possessed teacher through the underground bunker of Heavenly Host. Moments before her death, the young woman mentions being friends with Naho. Confirming this right away, the story flashes back to the two girls enjoying a concert. Unlike the more sinister, deadpan version of Naho from Heavenly Host, this iteration is far more cheery. That said, she's also remarkably busy, with both friends being quite popular within their respective fields. Enjoying each other's company, they spend what little free time they have hanging out together. Mentioning her radio show, Sayaka is interested in using Naho's expertise to make things more entertaining. It takes a bit of coaxing, but Naho eventually agrees to the request. Getting ready to head home for the night, Sayaka decides to make a quick detour, stopping by the house of Naho's mentor to borrow a book. Being introduced to Mr. Kibiki, the homeowner is very welcoming to the friend of his apprentice. Drinking some tea together, Taguchi the cameraman also makes a brief appearance. After Sayaka leaves, Kibiki talks with Naho about her research on Heavenly Host, quite enthusiastic about the find. However, it seems this has taken a toll on Naho, experiencing fierce side effects from the spiritual exposure. Managing to keep this relatively under control, the girl worries for the safety of the other two team members. Returning from the haunted ground the strange paper doll. It seems this may be what triggered the curse. She's also hesitant about going on Sayaka's radio show, as too much discussion on spirits may end up putting her in danger. Her paranormal activities may be risky, but her infatuation with Kibiki makes the effort worthwhile. The next morning, Kibiki attempts to talk Naho out of going to Heavenly Host, but finds her room empty. Discovering a note left for him, the girl mentions her plan to join them after coming home from school. Kibiki appreciates the gesture, but is determined not to put her in harm's way. Throughout the day, the curse that's been affecting Naho continues to get stronger. A few hours later, the radio show begins, and the spiritual expert has become increasingly nervous. This is for good reason, as Sanchiko has now manifested herself in the corner of the room. Trying to hide this while on the air, Sayaka gradually notices Naho constantly peering over to the same spot, going on to draw more attention to it. Deflecting the dangerous questioning, the show concludes without incident. Sayaka Sayaka is still curious about what Naho saw, but thankfully, the apparition has seemingly vanished for the time being. However, one of the crew members claims he can hear an additional voice as he plays back the audio. Looping a specific section multiple times, the hidden words become more discernible. Immediately after, the lingering spirit makes its presence known, attacking the director. Watching the chaos ensue, Sayaka is understandably shaken by the strange occurrence. Leaving the studio, Naho feels responsible for what happened, but Sayaka doesn't blame her. Keeping her mood up, Sayaka relays how the director eventually recovered at the hospital and is also grateful that the show was quite eventful. Parting ways, Naho is now fully convinced that going to Heavenly Host is a terrible idea. Unfortunately, it's too late to convince Kibiki, as he's already made the trip with Taguchi. Alone with the note he left for her, Naho starts to panic. Making the trip to Sayaka's house, Naho gradually becomes more hysterical. The friend isn't sure
sure how to react, seeing this kind of behavior for the first time. Following Naho back to Kibiki's house, Sayaka is better informed of the situation. Needing another person to perform the crossover ritual, Naho pleads with her companion for assistance. Wanting to pay her back for the appearance on her show, Sayaka agrees, willing to help the friend she cares about. Needing to get ready before the trip, Sayaka takes a bit of time to head back home. Briefly left to her own devices, Naho makes preparations of her own. Doing everything she can for Kibiki, the girl updates her blog with the steps of the charm ritual, dooming Kalma's students to death. Upon reuniting, both girls steal themselves as they make their way into Heavenly Host. Waking up in an unknown location, Sayaka quickly realizes that she's by herself. Leaving the tiny storehouse, the young woman makes her way into the underground shelter. Exploring the large area, Sayaka eventually comes across a mysterious pitch black room. Suddenly getting bathed in light, the grim surroundings make themselves known. Terrified by the remnants of torture all around her, Sayaka screams out in fear. Hearing the faint sound of footsteps in the the distance, the girl panics, realizing she may have just compromised herself. Unable to escape without being seen, Sayaka makes the hasty decision to hide in the nearby closet. Peeking through a crack in the door, the young lady watches the possessed teacher slowly walk into the room, carrying another person with them, where we introduce to Nana, currently still alive after being taken away from Mayu. Strapping the girl to a table, the man proceeds to use a pair of bloody pliers to rip her tongue out. Understandably, it doesn't take long before Nana's remains life fades away. The murderer takes his leave, prompting Sayaka to do the same before she meets her own untimely demise. She successfully escapes, but there's little room for celebration, as she wanders underground for an unknown period of time. Coming back to the present, Sayaka returns to the moment just before her death. She remained hopeful, but sadly became another victim of the cursed school. Unlike the previous entry, this part of the game receives three full manga chapters, giving it the chance to properly flesh things out. All of the main story beats get carried over, making the adaptation of this section almost spot on. However, I'd actually go as far as saying that the manga is the better version here. This is thanks in part to some additional scenes, as well as slightly different writing when it comes to Naho. While she's certainly dedicated herself to Kibiki's well-being, the game makes her seem a lot more selfish. Freaking out about his trip to Heavenly Host, the girl's first response is to frantically run to Sayaka's house, insisting she come back with her. Explaining what happened, Naho gets emotional, convincing Sayaka to make the journey. Immediately after, that emotion vanishes, posting about the charm with sinister intentions. Warping to the school, Naho remains absent for the duration of their stay. With this information, Naho's intentions feel very disingenuous, especially after claiming that she would protect her friend. Given that the visual novel has more leeway when it comes to length, it's surprising that there are more scenes to put things in a better light, because the manga does just that. After finding Kibiki's notes, Naho still freaks out, putting the ritual online for others to find. That said, before talking with Sayaka again, Naho shows her determination to protect her. Before she asks the friend to help, another panel shows Naho feeling guilty about putting her in harm's way. This is later reinforced by more internal thoughts of regret. Rather than it being a selfish request, Naho truly comes across as desperate here, conflicted that Sayaka has to join her. After she agrees to the proposition, Naho is again shown making her friend safety a priority. Arriving at Heavenly Host, an original scene has Naho actively searching for both Kibiki and Sayaka. Even before Sayaka's death, we see Naho crying tears of joy from finding her again, though this ends up being a small dream sequence before she gets killed. This isn't the end, as a short bonus chapter adds another great scene. Making her way underground, Naho eventually does find Sayaka's remains, utterly crushed that she wasn't able to save her. Losing her mind, Naho laughs hysterically with the cause of her darkening being shown. Heading back to the school, Kibiki is now the sole thing on her mind. The first chapter of this arc even foreshadows the events that follow in Blood Covered. Speaking of which, the manga version of the first game potentially sheds some additional light on Naho's behavior. While the previous curse latches on and gradually increases in potency, this other iteration shows Sachiko directly attacking the girl while she's exploring the haunted site. Having some of her spiritual powers stolen, Naho has difficulty resisting the apparition 
apparition following her around. This leads to a slightly different plot point, but the earlier possession provides a little more context to the situation. Discovering that Kibiki left a heavenly host without her, it's entirely possible that Sachiko manipulated her emotions. She probably wouldn't have gone with the nuclear option if she had a clear mind, but losing to her desperation, the charm was publicly shared. Of course, her infatuation with Kibiki could have just as easily led to this decision, wanting acknowledgement by any means necessary. This could explain her emotional shift in the game, going on to disappear as the darkening takes hold. In this particular timeline, she also never witnessed Sayaka's death, so the events actually work out. The curse takes more of a backseat in the Book of Shadows manga, until Sayaka's death forces it to erupt. Whatever the case may be, Naho regrettably became the catalyst that caused countless people to die. Trapped under a powerful influence, it isn't necessarily clear whether her actions were her own. It's all certainly interesting to consider, but as far as the Book of Shadows manga goes, this is the strongest part so far. That said, does the rest hold up in comparison? The opening of Chapter 5 reunites us with the late Mayu, currently being admired by Morishige. While probably not what the girl had in mind, the boy does consider her body to be beautiful in this state. Recalling the way in which he scared Yuka previously, the young man is referring to just before the girl's encounter with Kizami. Relishing the despair he caused, it seems that the darkening has started to work its way in. Knowing he needs to correct his behavior for appearances, Morishige reluctantly deletes his personal corpse collection, shifting to another girl that just arrived at Heavenly Host, were introduced to Mitsuki, alone with her new surroundings. Exploring the area, she eventually runs into Kurosaki, a familiar classmate stuck on a different floor. Waiting for him to work his way over, she's instead met by Fukuroi, a more responsible student she knows quite well. Inquiring about his own search efforts, the young man states that Mitsuki is the first person he's come across. Deciding they can always double back to the waiting spot at any time, the duo takes the initiative in searching for the rest of their friends. Notice Noticing a severed head with an item in its mouth, Fukuroi digs his hand in to retrieve a key. Using it to unlock the nearby art room, the students then find a palette knife. Bringing this to the music room, the art supply digs out another key stuck in a piano. Using it to open a box sitting close by, the duo receives a protective charm for their troubles. Wandering the halls, they then come across an old wind-up key on the floor. Saving it for later, the students use the recently acquired charm to remove the seal's block in the girls' bathroom on the second floor. Entering the room, Mitsuki notices a peculiar hole in one of the stall doors. Inserting the wind-up key, she turns it, seemingly doing nothing at first. However, it doesn't take long before an earthquake changes part of the building. Upon returning to the first floor entrance, the duo now finds it unlocked, leaving to see what they can find outside. Moving back to Morishige, the young man still hasn't had any luck finding his friend. Checking a corpse for any information he can find, the search comes up empty. This doesn't stop him from staring, though, losing himself in his series of morbid thoughts. Interrupting him, Taguchi makes an appearance, having been separated from Kibiki after making it to the school. Staying cautious, Morishige briefly explains his circumstances to the cameraman. Going through the footage he's taken since he arrived, Taguchi wonders if he hasn't already seen Mayu's remains somewhere. Being chastised for this remark, the elder man at least confirms that she isn't among the deceased. Politely refusing the offer to work together, Morishige's inner thoughts give away his true feelings. Agreeing to at least meet up again in an hour, a compromise is made to exchange information. Checking one of the classrooms, Morishige finds a spool of kite string. Moving to another room, he then pockets a small piece of wire. Noticing an object at the bottom of a hole in the floor, Morishige combines the items into a makeshift fishing rod. Pulling a student ID to the surface, it appears he's found the one Mayu lost previously. Panicking briefly, the teen rationalizes that she most likely just dropped it, still being safe elsewhere. Heading to the entrance where they plan to meet, it seems that Morishige a bit too early to catch up with Taguchi. Using the extra time to continue searching, he runs into the other two students from before. After introductions are exchanged, Morishige inquires if they may have come across Mayu, showing them the ID that was just acquired. Unfortunately, neither person has anything to report. Invited to search the school with them, Morishige accepts the offer, knowing a refusal would only cause more problems in the long run. Checking the girls' bathroom on the third floor, the group discovers a logbook that belonged to a previously living student.
student, moving to a nearby classroom, an apparition instructs them to return the item to the reference room. Encountering a numeric lock, the solution is found using all of the listed numbers from the disaster drill section of the logbook. Upon entering, the students engage in a bit of small talk, testing Morishige's limits with social interaction. Things remain cordial, though he can't help being cynical towards the people he just met. Unable to ignore an odd statue on one of the shelves, the group decides to take it with them. After Mitsuki accidentally drops it, Morishige notices something inside, smashing the rest of the object to reveal a key. Using it to unlock another classroom, the group finds a valuable alcohol lamp. This is quickly taken advantage of to proceed through an unnatural darkness blocking the pool's locker room. Arriving outside, Mitsuki and Fukuroi locate Emi, one of the individuals they'd been looking for. Oddly, she pushes them away, visibly on edge for an unknown reason. The two classmates run after their paranoid friend, leaving Morishige to resume his search for Mayu alone. Shifting yet again, we're properly introduced to Nari and Chihaya on the hunt for their missing companion Nana. Heading to the second floor of the school, the pair comes across what seems to be a battery for an electrical device. Moving down to the first floor, the young students find Taguchi, currently lying unresponsive on the ground. Back with Morishige, the boy's psyche is starting to take a turn for the worse, claiming to have heard Mayu's voice a number of times now. Losing his patience, he takes his aggression out on a nearby corpse. Catching himself in the act, the teen becomes concerned about his strange actions. Returning to his shaky mental state, Morishige goes back to taking glamour shots of the dead. Thinking it would be more productive to search for Taguchi than to keep standing around, the student wanders back into the halls. It doesn't take long for him to encounter Nana's friends, but he's more curious about the seemingly dead cameraman behind them. Making his way through another round of introductions, Morishige is disappointed to learn that these two haven't seen Mayu either. Receiving the camera battery from Nari, the elder student examines the video footage that was left behind. Being full of dead bodies, the girls understandably get disgusted, but Morishige thinks the collection is incredible. Noticing that the girls look confused, it seems that he accidentally gave himself away. Becoming increasingly wary of the strange guy in front of them, the young students decide it would be best if they part ways. Left on his own, Morishige has nearly succumbed to his dark urges, craving more photos to keep for himself. Heading over to Fukuroi, he's currently in the process of falling, having been smashed in the head by an unknown object. Recalling the results of their earlier chase, the duo eventually found Emi again, minus everything above her shoulders. Leaving their friend behind, Fukuroi became the next victim of the possessed teacher shortly after. Attempting to shield himself from the next blow, the teen's arm gets mangled as a result. Barely able to move, he tries to prevent his attacker from going after Mitsuki, but this hardly makes a difference. Miraculously, Fukuroi manages to hang on to his life, but knows he doesn't have much time left. Suddenly, someone new appears before him. Using the last of his strength, the student begs the stranger to protect his friends. Agreeing to the proposal, the mystery man proceeds to stab Fukuroi in the stomach. Met with some uncaring words, the injured teen breathes his last. Frantically searching the halls for her other classmate, Mitsuki's efforts yield no result. Retreating into the yard room, the terrified girl grabs a chisel to defend herself. In no time at all, a figure approaches the helpless student. Thankfully, Mitsuki knows this person, relieved to see her other classmate Kizumi. Telling her she doesn't need to worry about being on the defensive, the boy takes the weapon for himself. Unexpectedly, Kizumi stabs the chisel towards her, narrowly missing as she dodges. Continuing the assault, the psychopath reveals himself to be the true killer of Fukuroi. Running away in terror, Mitsuki is convinced that she can't trust anyone anymore. Coming across Morishige, the girl is far more agitated now. Noticing blood on his hands, Mitsuki is reaffirmed in her decision to stay away from others. Leaving Morishige behind, it seems this choice was for the best, as his remarks have become increasingly sinister. Getting some distance, Mitsuki heads upstairs, only to be reunited with the one hunting her down. Chased relentlessly, the girl pleads for Kizumi to stop, only for him to coldly stab her in response. Keeping her pinned down, the cruel teen is ready to fully indulge himself with a proper weapon. Forced to endure a tremendous amount of pain, Mitsuki knows she's done for. Wanting to spite the psychopath's desire for screams, she vows to remain silent until her dying breath. Furious at this turn of events, Kizumi stabs the girl countless times to get some sort of reaction out of her, ultimately failing in the end. Morishige eventually discovers the aftermath of Kizumi 
Azumi's violence, amazed at the remarkable work of art lying before him. Taking plenty of pictures, the twisted individual uses his phone to preserve Mitsuki's beauty. Returning to the infirmary, Morishige is greeted by his favorite corpse. Again being troubled by the necessity of deleting his collection, he decides there isn't any rush, wanting to keep his personal museum safe for as long as possible. This entry in particular is pretty interesting lore-wise, as we get a lot of time to see who Morishige is as a person. He's always calm and collected, and despite his annoyance at dealing with people, he quickly adapts to whatever situation he's thrown into. He's also incredibly dedicated to the one girl he cares about. That said, arguably the most interesting part about him is how he changes in Heavenly Host. In a lot of cases, the darkening happens relatively quickly, fully manifesting after a person has lost all hope. Morishige, on the other hand, is a special case. Throughout the story, he's constantly going back and forth with himself, attempting to hold back the morbid fascination towards his surroundings. By the end, he hasn't given in to despair at all, but rather embraces the so-called beauty all around him to the point of euphoria. There's also a different angle that adds another layer to this. In two specific wrong ends, we get to see Morishige directly interact with Sachiko. The first route involves the teen getting deceived by a fake version of Mitsuki, who goes on to drop the disguise shortly after. Unlike Sachiko's other victims, Morishige catches the eye of the sadistic spirit. She goes on to say that he's a rare kind of person that resonates with the insanity of the school. Seeing right through him, Sachiko knows that he only really cares about himself. Wanting him to see Mayu's deformed body, the girl lets him go, knowing the display has already been fully appreciated. The other related wrong end happens if Morishige fully succumbs to the darkening while exploring the school. Brought to the underground torture chamber, the teen is bound to a chair, later being woken up by Sachiko. Wondering if he's done for, the girl teases him, curious how he'll react to the current situation. Making Morishige a witness, the spirit brings Emi into the room, strapping her down while still alive. Cutting the girl open with a sickle, Sachiko proceeds to dig into the open stomach with her bare hands. Looking back to Morishige, the psychotic ghost is pleased by what she sees. Fascinated by the display, the young man forcibly has a dark urge unlocked from within. Offering him the chance to join her in the festivities, Sachiko watches the eagerness of the teen waiting to be released. While the main story certainly doesn't fare well for Morishige, Shige's mental state, it definitely doesn't compare to the insane desire set free in other routes. Receiving three full chapters, the manga portion mostly follows the main story beats, but there's a variety of small changes worth noting. One difference is seen right away, as Mayu's body is now drawn with more graphic detail. Where a certain request is displayed as a passing line of dialogue, the manga dedicates a few panels to actually showing the interaction. Morishige's photo taking has also been downplayed, judging to Gucci after finding out he's been filming by bodies around the school. One of the bigger changes takes place just after the meeting with Mitsuki and Fukuroi. Cutting out their prior exploration, this is the first time we see these characters here. Revealing Mayu's ID, the duo is now the one who initially came across it. Now rejecting their offer to work together, Morishige remains alone for the duration of his search. The following scene involving Mitsuki and Fukuroi seems to be a combination of events taking place in the same room. Finding a strange box, the pair decides to open it. This seems to line up with their exploration of the music room, as similar dialogue is said about the contents. However, unlike the charm they find in the game, a severed head waits for them in the manga. Noticing a body nearby, they watch as the spirit of the headless girl appears before them. Giving some decent advice, the apparition warns the students not to trust anyone. This is most likely a reference to another wrong end stemming from helping a lingering spirit in the halls. Wanting his head returned to him, the duo checks the entrance, finding the missing article shot into one of the shelves. Using a bucket to bring the item back, the spirit is grateful at first, but it doesn't take long for things to go south. The ghost transports them underground, resulting in their death. While the manga spirit is far more friendly, the events that follow remain the same. Losing consciousness after being attacked, a flashback is shown referencing events from the start of the game's seventh chapter. Kizumi's inclusion is almost exactly one-to-one, -one, coming across more sinister thanks to some excellent facial expressions. Finding Taguchi again, Morishige is by himself, as Nari and Chihaya have been cut from this section. Finally, upon returning to Mayu's body, he now hears her voice begging him not to look. This inclusion is a bit strange, as it calls back to his reaction in Blood Cover. As far as I can remember, the only instance of this dialogue in Book of Shadows is during the aforementioned wrong end with Sachiko.
That said, with this chapter being an alternate universe tale, it isn't necessarily canonical. The manga may be trying to loop things back to what the first game started, with Morishige losing his mind and jumping out a window. Blood Drive reveals that he survives the fall, seemingly coming to terms with his insanity as he scoops the girl's remains into a bag. Personally, I think this section is one of the more exceptional ones, with the manga portion not falling too far behind. Having said that, let's see what the rest has to offer. Chapter 6 opens in the science lab, with Yuka waking up restrained on one of the tables. Confused by her surroundings, the young girl tries to recall what led to this moment, until Kizumi interrupts these thoughts. Asking for help, Yuka is surprised to learn that the person in front of her was the one responsible for tying her up. Showered with affection by her new older brother, the girl becomes increasingly nervous. Brandishing a knife, Yuka gives the young man exactly what he's looking for. This is only the beginning though, as Kizumi has far worse plans in store for the hospital hostage. Ripping her uniform, the weapon gets ever closer to its final destination. Denying the supposed sibling, Yuka makes Kizumi slightly annoyed with her remarks. Watching the girl wet herself out of fear, the teen finds himself briefly pitying the helpless victim. Losing himself in thought, Kizumi is shocked at the idea that any semblance of emotion might still be locked away somewhere. Recalling violent acts from his younger days, it seems the teen had always been wary of his cold-blooded tendencies. Given up on by his parents, they instead focused on his old her brother and sister. The siblings became the ones to take care of him, with Kizumi's brother in particular trying to remove the young boy's cruel nature. Getting into a fight one day, the older teen wants his little brother to fully appreciate the value of life. Completely unreceptive to this, Kizumi is tired of the sibling's holier-than-thou attitude. Held back by his sister, Kizumi confesses how badly he wants a younger family member to take care of. Trying to connect with them, the sister is shut down by the angry brick wall in front of her. Not trusting anyone, Kizumi Kizumi took the time to observe people, learning how to effectively blend in. Unamused by the act his classmates present to each other, the teen carries himself through the mundane interactions with ease. Now attempting to understand them, he thinks killing those around him will provide a chance for them to see his true self. Executing this plan after arriving at Heavenly Host, Kizumi still doesn't have a shred of remorse for humanity. Having confirmed this, he also realizes that by committing these acts, his future is effectively sealed. However, by finding Yuka, the murderer thinks he might be able to reverse his state of affairs. Forcibly taking her with him, Kizumi is ready to put this to the test. Back in the present, Yuka notices that the killer hasn't moved for a while. Taking the opportunity to cry for help, the girl's actions only serve to break Kizumi out of his daydream. Continuing to be denied as a replacement sibling, the assailant recoils back, fighting against a surge of internal pain. He had finally achieved a means of retribution, but it seems even this won't be able to save him. Having doubts now, the teen tries to convince himself that he can't change so easily. Thinking Kizumi has a headache, Yuka selflessly offers the attacker some medicine. Caught off guard by this gesture, Kizumi doesn't notice the possessed teacher appearing behind him. Having his head smashed, the high schooler regrets not being able to fix his life through someone else. Hearing the command from Sachiko to kill Yuka next, the teacher raises his hammer to fulfill the request. Oddly, he disobeys, breaking the rope that was keeping Yuka in place. Again being told to finish the girl off, the man collapses to the ground, refusing with all his might. It seems that a tiny shred of humanity still lingers, remembering the torture he witnessed during the first game. Using this small bit of time to look around the room, Yuka finds a bottle of hydrochloric acid, quickly throwing it at the large figure. As the man stumbles back, his hammer shatters the overhead light, bathing the area in darkness. With Yuka taking the opportunity to run away, Sachiko is left wondering about a charm potentially keeping her safe. Chasing after what appeared to be her real big brother, Brother, the girl is interrupted by an earthquake, destroying the floor underneath her. Falling to the underground bunker below, the girl receives little damage, but doesn't have a clue where she is anymore. After making a brief stop in a nearby bathroom, Yuka comes across another area that's pitch black. Managing to find a light switch, she discovers the horrifying dumping grounds for a variety of dead students. Understandably shaken by this, Yuka quickly retreats back into the hall. Exploring elsewhere, she eventually comes across Sachiko, who's currently in a lot of 
of pain. Rubbing the girl's back, it seems to alleviate the suffering a bit. Claiming to have just woken up here, Sachiko does an exceptional job playing the victim. With Yuka enjoying her new big sister role, she's ready to keep her companions safe. Being asked if her ghostly appearance scares her, Yuka assures the girl that it isn't a problem. Before they head out, Sachiko wonders if her new sibling would be willing to listen to a request of hers. Agreeing to this, Sachiko is satisfied with the answer, putting aside the question for the time being. Leaving to search for Satoshi, the two girls make their way deeper into the tunnels. Upon entering the torture chamber, Sachiko begins to shiver, with Yuka ready to step up to help her. Being asked for her socks, Yuka does one better and donates her shoes as well. Well, feeling bad that she only just noticed the other girl's condition. Content with only the socks, Sachiko shows concern towards the one taking care of her. Bonding a little over this activity, Yuka is ready to resume the search for Satoshi. Amused by the display of bravado, Sachiko can't help but break character. Not fully catching the words, Yuka gets told that she must have been hearing things. Walking over to the girl's bathroom, Sachiko now claims to be in pain. Silently staring at the shoe she previously rejected, the young girl cheers up as her big sister gives them to her with no hesitation. Shortly after this, Sachiko gets the urge to check the storehouse where Sayaka initially appeared. Finding a camera in the corner of the room, Yuka is fine with Sachiko keeping this as well. Using some of the old futons that had been stashed there earlier, the girls get some much needed rest. Being shaken awake by her scared companion, Yuka is worried that something bad is coming. Thankfully, it's far less serious, as Sachiko has lost her hairpin. Wanting to help in any way she can, Yuka has asked for her headband. Refusing the request this time, Sachiko doesn't take it well, demanding it from her now. Carefully navigating the situation, Yuka gives a valid reason for holding on to the precious item. Accepting this answer, Sachiko backs down, potentially being reminded of her own mother through this. Continuing their journey, Yuka notices that the young girl is still somewhat upset. Wanting to do what she can, the elder sister is willing to offer something else in place of the headband. Taking her up on this, Sachiko wants to make a detour into the corpse room that Yuka Yuka had visited earlier. Entering the area, Yuka finds Sachiko lying near the edge of the bloody pool. Checking on her, the spirit pushes her companion into the murky mess of bodies. Nearly joining them as another victim, Yuka is miraculously lifted above the surface by Sachiko. Covered in a variety of body parts and fluids, Yuka understandably passes out from shock. Waking up a little later, Sachiko looks remorseful, which is strange given the laughter the other girl could have sworn she heard before losing consciousness. Again putting her suspicion to the side, Yuka refuses to doubt the seemingly innocent spirit. Leaving the room, a strange haze is latched onto Yuka, now finding it harder to move for some reason. Being told how messy she is by Sachiko, the elder sister agrees, laughing the remark off. Oddly, Yuka hadn't even made the effort to say those words, but they came out of her mouth regardless. Putting up with more insults, the entranced girl has fallen into a state of forced apathy. Willing to give her companion anything, Yuka is met with a rather extreme request. At first, she's able to refuse, struggling to maintain herself. However, within moments, she loses control, surrendering completely. Watching the young girl laugh maniacally at this development, Yuka becomes fully aware of the spirit's true development. Demeanor. Using the last of her strength, Yuka manages to make a proper objection. Unfortunately, it makes little difference at this point, with Sachiko hellbent on stealing the life that was promised to her. The last bit of resistance dies out, leaving Yuka to accept her fate. Immediately after, the possessed teacher appears behind her, smashing her head to pieces. Using the camera she'd kept from before, Sachiko takes a picture of the bloody masterpiece she's created. Revealing her true motivations, the apparition claims the paper scrap from the charm that brought her here. Making one last request, the spirit plans to take Yuka's big brother for herself. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, Sachiko has taken a liking to Yuka, ready to spend more time with her in the near future. When it comes to the cast of Corpse Party, I'd have to say that Kizumi is one of my favorites. With Heavenly Host being full of deadly spirits, you'd think that any human interaction would be positive. In Kizumi's case, it's the exact opposite. Just when some of the characters think they're safe, they experience an even greater terror at the hands of an uncaring psychopath almost makes you reconsider which would be worse to encounter. It's interesting getting to see his personal motivations through his interaction with Yuka. With the game being more limited in scenes, the manga does a pretty good job picking up the visual slack. Though fair warning, some of this section's imagery is more suggestive than what gets seen elsewhere, and if that bothers you, I'd say tread carefully here. The first half is essentially the same as its counterpart, with Kizumi ready to violently carve into Yuka. Past this, there are a few noteworthy 
were the additions to Kisumi's flashback, primarily during the high school segment. Rather than a few character stills, we actually get to watch the teen interact with his peers during the monologue, faking his way through school. Kisumi continuously has a smile plastered on his face. The cynical thoughts about his surroundings culminate in this excellent panel, keeping his mask facing forward, while his ultimate desire bides its time in the shadows. Later questioning if Yuka could have fixed his life, the emotion actually comes through as Kizumi tears up. Before his last moments, the game simply has him yell out after being offered headache medicine. The manga shows him pushing past that doubt, convinced that he's gone too far. Fully committing himself, Kizumi finally brings the knife down, only for the teacher to interrupt him before he can finish the act. He did manage to go all the way in tortured souls, but that scenario is a bit different. I also questioned if it would be possible for a psychopath to actually experience emotion like this. Finding an article from Yale University, it apparently is possible for this to happen, but only under very specific conditions. One of these is when emotion is part of their goal, and with this in mind, it actually fits in the scenario. Hoping he could turn his life around, Kizumi saw Yuka out for the express purpose of unlocking those hidden emotions. Only then would he be able to properly atone for the things he'd done. Obviously, this wouldn't do him much good, as he's already a murderer at this point, but from a personal standpoint, it does open things up for change, if only slightly. After Yuka gets free, she runs straight for the exit, not using the acid to get away. You do have the option to do this in the game, but Yuka ends up getting killed as a result. Falling to the underground below, Yuka does visit the bathroom, but this time, she doesn't have the initial encounter with the room full of bodies. Instead, she meets Sachiko right away, and the two begin the search for Satoshi soon after. Everything that happens afterwards follows a slightly different path. Immediately after they head out, Sachiko asks for Yuka's shoes right away. In the process of thanking her, she has the realization that her hairpin is missing. Not happy with Yuka's response, Sachiko stops talking to her big sister. Asked where they should search for the object, the spirit guides them to the corpse room. There's far less of a buildup when it comes to the item requests, which is unfortunate as the gradual increase makes for a better ending. The locations are cut out as well, so no return trip to the bathroom, no torture chamber, and no storehouse. In the game, you could say that Sachiko pushing Yuka into the bloody pool was reactionary, even though we know better. In the manga, the same thing happens, but with no real cause. While freaking out at first, it doesn't take long for Yuka to calm back down, assuming the hairpin is the cause of this. Making a manga-exclusive request, Sachiko rips some of her sister's hair out, keeping it for herself. The rest of the scene plays out the same, with one important difference. Sachiko doesn't take Yuka's picture. As they never went to the storehouse, the camera was never found. The reason the photo is a big deal is because this entire chapter is directly linked to the best wrong end from Blood Covered. For the sake of context, I'll give a brief explanation of events leading up to this. Initially, Yuka is the one who runs into Kizumi after losing track of Satoshi. She sticks with him until he shows his true colors. Forced to run, it's up to the player to safely guide Yuka away from the psychopath. If he manages to catch her, she gets taken to the science lab, tied up in a similar fashion. Kizumi gets smashed in the same way, but in this iteration, it's implied that Yuka also gets killed in the science lab. Elsewhere, Satoshi and Naomi have a less than friendly meeting with Shinozaki during the finale. Heading back the way they came, the two discover an envelope with a picture inside. This photo is the exact same as the one from Book of Shadows, meaning that Yuka's journey through the underground eventually leads up to this moment. Obviously, the execution is different, but it's pretty cool seeing how this was all tied together from another perspective. It's a detail exclusive to the game, but the manga still does a good job overall with the scenes that it does portray. From here, there's only two sections left to go, so let's see how the rest fares. Moving slightly into the past, Chapter 7 opens with a flashback of Fukuroi and Mitsuki's time at school. Organizing a cleaning day, a few other side characters are dragged into the plans. Shifting to a nearby classroom, Toko Kurosaki is introduced as the main character of this particular segment. It turns out she's interested in Kizumi, asking his friend Kurosaki if he happens to be available. The teen gives her positive news, but having known the boy since childhood, he isn't sure how well the arrangement will work out. This doesn't dissuade Toko, 
more confident now that she's confirmed the situation. Joining in with the group activities, the girl is looking forward to a nice relaxing evening. However, things don't go according to plan, as Toko is now busy puking her guts out in an unfamiliar bathroom. Finishing the cleaning work, the students decided to try out the Sachiko Ever After charm for themselves. Being warped to Heavenly Host, it didn't take long for one of the teens to get heavily injured. Kizumi offers to carry him through the school, but Toko points out that it would be safer to secure an exit first. Feeling the pressure from making the suggestion, the girl takes it upon herself to search the area. Thankfully, she doesn't have to go alone, as Kizumi volunteers without hesitation. Joining the duo, the abrasive Shimada completes the search party. Going downstairs, the group eventually makes their way past the infirmary, finding a key sticking out of the lock. Quickly turning it, Shimada secures the room, pocketing the item for himself. Tossing it into the air for his entertainment, it doesn't take long for him to lose the precious article. Making their way to the first floor, the trio finds a way out. Though unlike all of the previous attempts to go outside, the doors now open without a problem. Surrounded by an endless sea of trees, the group isn't sure what to make of the exterior. Taking matters into his own hands, Shimada decides to bail on the others, not having the patience to wait around. Before taking his leave, he tries convincing Toko to come with him. Not amused by this in the slightest, the girl tells him off with no hesitation. Revealing a large knife, Shimada employs a more threatening tactic. Shocking the crude individual, Kizumi scoffs at him, not intimidated whatsoever. Leaving Shimada behind, the other two make their way back to the second floor, with Toko still fuming from the earlier encounter. Trying to lighten the mood, the girl attempts to compliment Kizumi, only being met with a light reaction. Approaching the third floor, the duo hears Mitsuki suddenly cry out from the floor below. Deciding it would be wiser to report back to the main group first, the teens head upstairs, reuniting with the other students. Their attention is currently elsewhere. The injured teen has stopped responding, leaving the others unsure if he's still alive. With the path outside secured, everyone decides that it's time to leave before it's too late for their friend. Wanting to make sure that Mitsuki doesn't miss them, Toko leaves this situation in Kizumi's hands. Running to the first floor, the girl searches the area, but can't find a trace of the other classmate. Returning to the second floor empty-handed, Toko spots one of the spirit children by the staircase. Retreating to the first floor entrance, a friendlier ghost is waiting by the door. Receiving what appears to be an amethyst, she's told that the item will provide temporary protection from an attack. Coming back to the previous apparition, Toko uses the gemstone to eliminate the looming threat. Moving to the third floor, Emmy is now in a state of shock, unable to relay any information to her classmate. Pushing past her, Toko finds the injured teen in the same spot as before. Unfortunately, they were too late, with the young man breathing his last during the brief search. Attempting to recompose themselves, the girls move downstairs for some air, while Kizumi tries to convince the remaining individual to leave his friend's side. Suddenly, footsteps can be heard slowly coming down the hall, prompting the duo to hide for the time being. It turns out that Shimada made his way back inside, collapsing to the ground before reaching the other students. Wondering what's going on, they then watch the abrasive teen get surrounded by the child's spirits. Deciding they should try to help him, the girls nervously work their way closer. Within moments, the children quickly vanish, leaving behind the dead corpse of their former classmate. Hearing the two scream out, Kizumi runs downstairs, discovering the latest person to meet a gruesome end. Things only continue to get worse, as Sachiko has now appeared before the group. Ignoring them for the time being, the young spirit heads upstairs to where the last remaining classmate is. Moving in a panic, Emi chases after her, followed by Kizumi, who tells Toko to wait there for the time being. It doesn't take long before a scream rings out across the school, with Emi now desperate to get the other teen to come with them. Unfortunately, he's currently in denial, refusing to abandon his friend. Toko decides to come help, only to hear a strange sound on the way over. The disagreeable teen now finds himself partway down the stairs, along with the body of his companion. The other two aren't saying much of anything, leaving Toko unsure of what happened. Letting out another scream, Emi runs back to the second floor, with the other boy accusing Kizumi of being a murderer. Getting some much needed information, Toko learns that her crush had suddenly become violent towards the others. Watching him laugh as he plays around with the dead student's body, the girl is devastated by this development. Retreating to the infirmary, Toko doesn't want to believe that this is Kizumi's true nature. Aggravated by her classmate's lack of trust, Emi runs to the bottom floor to save herself. Unsure of what she should do, Toko stands in place, with Kizumi catching up in no time. Brandishing the former knife of Shimada, the teen looks plenty suspicious, but the girl wants a definitive explanation. Being asked why he committed 
the violent act, Kizumi's expression changes, walking past his accuser with disappointment in his eyes. Holding on to him tightly, the girl does everything she can to prevent him from making a terrible mistake. This results in Kizumi fiercely punching Toko in the head, bringing her to the floor with the impact. Hitting her again, the boy gets ready to make an example of the girl with his sharp new toy. Narrowly avoiding the psycho's grasp, Toko makes a break for the first floor stairs. Stumbling onto the landing, she realizes that one of her teeth was knocked loose from the previous encounter. Dropping it in a panic, her hand then brushes against the article that was lost during their initial exploration. Managing to grip the key in her shaky hands, Toko rushes to the infirmary to lock herself in. Kizumi lets her go, far more interested in the two that was left behind. Taking his time, the teen slowly grinds it up, happily ingesting the essence of another person. Discovering that the infirmary can only be locked from the outside, Toko desperately looks around the room for something to defend herself. Finding a pair of scissors, she knows the item wouldn't do her much good, deciding to hide instead. The chapter ends with a flashback to just after Sachiko went up to the third floor, but this time, it's through Kizumi's perspective. Tired of the other boy's refusal to cooperate, he was in fact the one who threw the lifeless body down the stairs, shoving the reality of the situation into his classmate's face. Emmy wasn't sure how to react, while the other student ran after his friend, tripping down the stairs on his own. Nursing an injured arm, he declares the aggressor to be a killer, escalating things on his own. Thanks to this catalyst, Kizumi now understands that he has free reign to indulge himself in his dark desires. Given a hunting ground with no restrictions, the teen plans to make the most of it. Quite a bit shorter in length, this section provides a little more context in regards to the trigger that sets Kizumi off on his killing spree. With this being the starting point, it seems the whims of the school eventually brought the killer in contact with the other students. Given how Sachiko seems to favor those with an affinity for death, it's interesting to consider how she may have indirectly guided the psycho to his classmates. Following the deaths of Emi, Fukuroi, and Mitsuki, the final person that knows him is his supposed best friend, Kurosaki. Interestingly enough, the first game shows this particular encounter during the main story. While their initial meeting is cordial, it doesn't take long before Kurosaki gets kicked through a hole in the floor, only to be stabbed mercilessly by Kizumi shortly after. The killer ends up meeting his own demise later on, though this is only during an alternate route. Although this entry doesn't show what happens to the two remaining students, we get a little more development thanks to Blood Covered, taking place sometime between chapters 3 and 4, where we introduce to Okawa, the one that declared Kizumi a murderer. Eventually finding himself in the underground bunker, he's just in time to save Yoshiki from the possessed teacher. Running back to the main school building, the two engage in a bit of small talk, with the blonde student grateful for the rescue. Suddenly, the two hear a voice yelling from the halls, turning out to be Kurosaki, just before Kizumi managed to find him. The two rush out to look for him, but the classmate is on a different plane of existence, making a reunion impossible. Getting too loud, Yoshiki is forced to cover Okawa's mouth, dragging him back to the classroom before they're caught by a certain individual. Apologizing for the outburst, the upset teen mentions his regret of not being able to save the friend who lost his leg. Going by Ryosuke, the two of them spent a lot of time together, more recently bonding over a certain dating game. Oddly enough, the handheld system that Okawa brought to the school turns itself on, with the game in question progressing on its own. Commenting on the fact that Ryosuke won't get to play a new route for his favorite character, Yoshiki finds out that the friend is no longer alive. Recalling the events from Chapter 7, Okawa has a moment of self-awareness, now understanding why Kizumi resorted to his extreme actions. Going on to make the connection that it's the deceased friend controlling the game, Yoshiki comforts his companion, telling him that as long as he has that system, the two will always be together. Interrupting this nice moment, the child's spirits make an appearance. Sensing the danger, the handheld jumps to the floor, playing through the game to distract the kids temporarily. Grateful to Ryosuke for the help, it unfortunately doesn't keep the children away for long. Getting some distance, Okawa suggests for them to split up, making it harder for them to get caught. Parting ways with his new friend, the boy dashes northward, followed by Yoshiki taking another hit from the possessed teacher. Thankfully, he retreats elsewhere for the time being. Waking up a bit later, Yoshiki resumes his search for Shinozaki, with the blow to the head causing him to forget his time with the other student. Following Okawa's path, the young man comes across his other classmate, Emi, with this iteration leaving her dead in the hallway. Observing the damage, the teen initially thinks Kizumi is responsible, but holds back his suspicion for the time being. Running into another girl, Okawa tries talking to her, but she's nearly inconsolable. Doing his best to soothe her nerves, the boy manages to calm her down.
down, not noticing the looming threat approaching from behind. Stabbing the classmate in the back, Kizumi is glad to have reunited with someone he knows. Telling the girl to run, the savior is forced to deal with the psycho's attacks on his own. Unlike Mitsuki, Okawa is fulfilling Kizumi's criteria for a satisfying kill. That is, until the target stops running, standing up to the antagonist in the same way the other girl did. Now correctly accusing him of being a murderer, Okawa bravely tells off the attacker with no hesitation. Unfortunately, Kizumi is unamused with the display, throwing his knife to finish the boy off. Failing to get more amusement out of his classmate, the psycho simply leaves him to bleed out, making his way to other parts of the school. Elsewhere, Toko manages to survive, though the ending of her story doesn't involve Kizumi at all. In Chapter 4, Satoshi comes across Naomi when she's attempting to hang herself. If he fails to save her, the young man is forced to explore the school alone from then on. Checking the infirmary, he finds Toko hiding inside, still frantic from her experience with Kizumi. Leaving her alone, the boy discovers an item in a different room, needing another person to catch it before it warps. Returning to the infirmary for hell, the girl's mental state is completely broken down, deciding now is the time to use the scissors she discarded previously. Stabbing Satoshi in the chest, the young man bleeds to death from the injury. However, there's an alternate outcome where an item blocks the attack by chance, saving the boy's life. Cowering in fear, Toko remains in the infirmary, unaware that her demise is all but guaranteed by staying in the deadly room. The manga version of this portion suffers the same fate as Chapter 3's adaptation, being streamlined for the sake of space. Cutting out the classroom segment, the scene immediately starts from inside Heavenly Host. Sidelining Toko, Kizumi again takes the lead role, giving a brief explanation of what led them all here. Shimada is also completely absent, with the group now being comprised of five students. Further emphasizing the rushed narrative, Mitsuki calls out to them before the initial search party finds the entrance. Wandering to the second floor, Kizumi discovers Shimada wandering the halls, only for the spirits to gather around him as he falls to his knees. In this iteration, the teen is a completely throwaway character, losing all development and introducing a slight plot hole. While the other girls are searching for Mitsuki, they come across Sachiko by the stairs. Running to warn the others, Emi tells Kizumi about the new threat heading upstairs. Noticing Shimada slumped over on the ground, the girl is told that the child's spirits are responsible for his death. She accepts this explanation, but she shouldn't, as Emi wasn't present for the killing. While the game has both Toko and Emi act as witnesses to Shimada's final moments, here, Kizumi is the lone spectator. Not having this frame of reference, Emi would likely suspect the only living person nearby, especially since the knife is clearly visible. Regardless, the events continue in the same fashion, with Kizumi kicking the lifeless body down the stairs. Taking Shimada's knife for himself, the psycho gets excited to cut loose. Catching back up with Toko, there's barely any dialogue now, pushed aside in favor of violent developments. As Kizumi eats the tooth, the rest of the panels merge together with Yuka's capture. With a little more than a full chapter showcasing these events, it does a passable job, but a lot of character moments get lost as a result of the length. That being said, there's only one section left, acting as a prologue to the finale of this series. Taking place after the events of the first game, Chapter 8 opens on Naomi standing outside of Seiko's house. Wanting to get verification from the siblings of the deceased girl, the high schooler is hopeful that they'll at least remember who she is. Being stopped at the last second, Shinozaki appears to prevent further damage from being dealt. Mentioning the research she's been doing, the girl discovered where Sachiko and her mother lived when they were still alive. With the location being in the nearby mountains, valuable information on the Curse of Heavenly Host could be within their grasp. Both desperate for answers, the girls immediately catch the next train without a moment's hesitation. During the ride, Shinozaki brings up the blog that Naho used to run before she passed on. While their friends have been forgotten by everyone, for some reason, both Naho and Kibiki still remain in memory. Thanks to this information, it seems viable that a solution to their problem may actually exist. Finishing the lengthy trip, the duo makes their way through the countryside. Revealing that Sachiko's family used to be fairly well known, Naomi is curious if Shinozaki 
Kawasaki is potentially related due to the shared name, but the other girl states that it is unlikely. Not having reliable directions, the two visit one of the few houses in the area, asking the owner for assistance. Inquiring about their destination, the woman gets defensive after learning the location. Having the door slammed in their face, the girls wonder why she had such a harsh reaction. With no one else around, the duo is forced to rely on themselves, following the road for quite some time. Eventually, another person drives by, curious why a couple of schoolgirls are walking in the middle of nowhere. Being told where they're headed, the man actually knows the spot, offering to drive them the rest of the way. Taking him up on the offer, the girls are brought deeper into the mountains, noticing that the driver's demeanor is starting to change. Regardless, they eventually arrive just outside of the estate, forced to walk the rest of the way. Parking his truck, the man assures his passengers that they'll have a ride waiting for them when they get back. With little time before nightfall, the duo starts their trek through the forest. Reaching the area in question, no trace of the home can be found anymore. Oddly, a barn is still standing nearby, prompting the girls to investigate the interior. Unfortunately, nothing of interest is found inside, so the two decide to leave for the time being. Walking back the way they came, the students gradually find the truck sitting where they left it. Noticing the absence of the driver, they aren't too concerned, as the vehicle has been left idling. Waiting for quite a while, their worries begin to increase, as the older man never returns. The girls consider returning to the train station on foot, but they note how dangerous it would be with low visibility. Holding their ground, another half hour passes, but the driver still doesn't make an appearance. Having no other option, the pair decides to head back to the barn to spend the night. Noting some kind of spiritual presence around them, Shinozaki thinks it would be best if they reach the shelter as soon as possible. Wandering for an unknown period of time, the duo completely loses track of their surroundings, swallowed by a sea of trees. With no end in sight, the girls are on the verge of giving up, until Naomi catches a glimpse of the distant barn. They had apparently forgotten to turn the lights off before leaving, grateful for the mistake. However, upon arriving, they discover that something entirely different was causing the bright aura. Appearing on the formerly empty lot, a strange building now stands menacingly. Glancing at the nameplate, the girls get the confirmation they were looking for. Full of determination, they head inside the small house, being met with a strong wave of spiritual resistance, stealing themselves. The two start their exploration of the interior. Looking around a study upstairs, they locate a key sitting out in the open. Hearing footsteps approaching, the duo quickly hides, feeling a presence rush past them. Staying on guard, they move to the neighboring room, using the newly acquired key to enter. Locating a vault inside of the wall, the girls know something worthwhile must be close. Trying a number of different ideas, every one of them fails to give them access. Recalling a picture in the entrance showing Sachiko's seventh birthday, Naomi tries just the single number, being exactly what they needed. Revealing a long staircase going down, the two are on the verge of discovering something major. Raising the tension further, the earlier footsteps have returned, seemingly closing in on the duo's location. Retreating down the secret passage, they hold their breath and hope for the best. Arriving at the bottom, the girls find themselves in a tiny room deep underground. Filled with books and other random papers, the pair assumes they'll find some kind of information amidst the clutter. Locating a family chart, a great deal is learned about Sachiko's lineage. Recognizing some of the names, Shinozaki recalls her sister mentioning these individuals, telling stories of their remarkable abilities. Not having any male heirs, this particular family only allowed men from outside of their group to join them temporarily. Once the next female was born, the husbands always passed away shortly after. Sachiko's mother was among the latest to carry on this tradition. Having optimal family placement, the woman inherited an exceptional amount of spiritual power, passing that on to Sachiko. Seeing more familiar names, it turns out that Shinozaki is also a descendant of the gifted lineage. Hearing a voice call out to her, the girl immediately recoils in pain. Recovering in moments, Shinozaki is now locked in a trance, fixating on a certain part of the room. Pulling numerous old boards away from the wall, she reveals another hidden space. Snapping back to reality, Shinozaki is shocked to find the Book of Shadows here of all places. Mentioning the brutal witch hunts that took place at the end of the Middle Ages, the tome was a means of preserving the dark arts that had been studied for generations. Full to the brim with all manner of spells, it's anyone's guess just how powerful the contents really are. That being said, Shinozaki has a flash of inspiration, hoping certain pages will be translated enough to give her what she needs. Getting closer, the girl comes across what seems to be the origin of Heavenly Host. Hitting the jackpot, Shinozaki lands on the page she was looking for, bringing the dead back to life. Naomi isn't convinced 
convinced that something like that is possible, but her classmate reminds her just how insane their surroundings are in general. Going on to bring up the questionable morality behind resurrection, the skeptical girl is again met with sound reasoning from her determined friend. Fully convinced now, Naomi is ready to proceed with the ritual. Aware of the consequences that could be waiting for her, Shinozaki puts the dour thoughts out of her mind for the time being. Beginning the spell, the two decide to kick things off by bringing Mayu back first. Gathering materials from around the room, the girl set up the ritual accordingly. Lining up three paper dolls in the center, the ones outside represent the casters, with the target being laid in between. Adding some blood to the mix, Shinozaki proceeds to complete the ceremony by chanting a specific list of words. After hours of execution, their efforts finally bear fruit as the book starts to react. With the photo of Mayu catching fire, it seems the revival is underway. Hearing another set of footsteps above them, they're accompanied by a familiar voice. The girls are initially excited, but Shinozaki gradually realizes that something is off about their old friend. Ready or not, their reunion is about to happen, as the visitor slowly makes her way downstairs to join them. Arriving in moments, Mayu has indeed returned to the land of the living, minus a few important facial features. Collapsing to the ground, the homunculus writhes in pain, crying out in distress. As her paper doll burns away, runic symbols appear all over Mayu's body. Spraying fountains of blood from the markings, the being's remaining life fades away. With the ritual ending in failure, the girls have nothing to show for their efforts. Suddenly, the symbols that had appeared on Mayu previously are now present on Shinozaki, with two screwdrivers from elsewhere in the room impaling her legs. Tracking to the other patterns, saw blades drive their way into her arms. Recalling the intense side effects that came with executing forbidden magic, Shinozaki can already tell that she doesn't have much longer to live. With the final rune stationed by her neck, the girl is desperate for Naomi to save the paper doll that's linked to her. Doing her best to stomp out the flames, the friend can't do anything to prevent the magical fire from spreading. Spotting an old paint can full of water, Naomi throws the contents onto the burning article. Unfortunately, this only aggravates the flames even more. Another saw blade finds its way into Shinozaki's neck, essentially marking her for death. Both girls are forced to reluctantly accept their fate, knowing they've crossed a line they can't come back from. Coming to their rescue, Shinozaki's sister Hinoe arrives on the scene, chanting a reverse spell to neutralize the ritual. Amazingly, this action works, putting the flames out and preventing the pair's untimely demise. Being held close, the high schooler wonders how her sister managed to find them in this strange place. Not being able to answer, the woman is forced to pay the price for meddling. The energy from the ritual wasn't actually negated, but diverted. Knowing what to expect, Hinoe sacrificed herself to save the other two. Left in utter shock by this development, this is where the game comes to a close. Acting as a prologue for the final Blood Drive game, this is the entry that a lot of fans consider to be the starting point for everything going downhill story-wise. The main source of this ire naturally comes from Shinozaki. Given what happens in this chapter, it becomes evident that she's not the best when it comes to thinking rationally. Instead of consulting with the other two that escaped Heavenly Host, Shinozaki wants to immediately head to the middle of nowhere without a plan. Finding the former residents of Sachigo, no thought is spared to leave exploring for another time when they're more prepared. You could make the argument that there's no guarantee the house will show up again, but there's actually something inside that proves otherwise. If you look above the embedded safe, a small shrine can be seen further up, housing a paper doll. Taking a closer look, the instructions for the Sachigo Ever After charm are found inside, though slightly modified from the version we know. As mentioned before, this is how Naho came across the ritual in the first place, having explored this area previously. The girl had been visiting the site for quite a while, meaning it would have been fine for Shinozaki and the others to return another day. Upon discovering the Book of Shadows, it's never questioned whether they should wait to use it. Naomi is the only one who voices concern, but Shinozaki shuts this down right away, foolishly engaging with forbidden magic despite the risks. Without even thinking, they don't realize that they already knew the perfect person to help with this. Hinoe wasn't mentioned much in my breakdown for the sake of brevity, but she makes two separate appearances in this chapter. She initially comes up during the discovery of the family tree, and again in a flashback, talking with her younger sister about the history of the Book of Shadows. It's clear that she's extremely knowledgeable when it comes to matters of the occult, but during an extra chapter in Blood Covered, we actually learn that this is what she does professionally for work. If the students had just brought the book back to 
to Hinaway, there's a good chance that she would have been able to properly decipher the ritual. Not only that, but if she had deemed the resurrection spell to be too dangerous, it's likely that another spell could have acted as some kind of workaround. They have an entire tome full of magic. Anything has the potential to solve their problem. More specifically, something that doesn't get them killed in the process. That said, I can still understand where Shinozaki is coming from with her hasty decisions. Being the one that recommended the charm in the first place, she probably carries an immense amount of guilt with her. When presented with an opportunity to make things right, she took it without hesitation, wanting to get the friends back that were lost. On a side note, it could also be questioned why Naho and Kibiki are still remembered despite dying in Heavenly Host. It's my understanding that individuals with strong spiritual power can maintain their existence. Naho is a given in this respect, with plenty of examples from other sources backing up her ability. Kibiki could go either way. Though being as involved with the occult as he was, it's possible that his related contributions keep him relevant in general. Whatever the case, it's certainly up for debate. The manga execution is a bit odd in the way it's organized. The final arc is split across all three volumes. The first part is at the end of volume one, the second and third parts are found at opposite ends of the next entry, and the others follow a similar pattern for the final book. On the whole, the arc itself does a decent job with the presentation, worse in some places and better in others. The scene actually begins with Hinoe, noting that a certain spiritual presence has grown in strength. Debating if she should bring this up to her younger sister, the woman eventually decides against it. This placement works better, as the same scene takes place just before chapter one of the game. Shifting over to the library, we actually see Shinozaki doing research and locating the former residence of Sachiko's family. Shortly after, she comes across Naomi, bringing us to where the game kicks things off. Giving her speech on the train, Shinozaki mentions the four people they lost in Heavenly Host. But there's an interesting detail worth noting here, showing the individuals in question. Not everyone is accounted for in regards to their source of death. While the female companions lost their lives in the presence of others, no one actually witnessed Morishige's death. Footage of his final moments ended up being found by Satoshi and Naomi, but it wasn't entirely conclusive. It's in the manga adaptation of Blood Cover that we find the remaining context. Rather than the other two students, Shinozaki is the one that comes across the deserted cell phone. Being shown the video of Morishige's death, the girl realizes that she was only moments away from potentially saving him. Looking out the nearby window, proof of his demise is finally seen. With the blood drive scene I mentioned before, this event gets reinterpreted, but it certainly isn't the only thing the game changes. Oddly enough, if the first manga is the work that gets referenced for Morishige, then Miss Yui's death is incorrect. Here, the teacher actually survives to the very end, giving up her paper scraps so another student can escape. If this acts as her better ending, then the extra ending shown in the other manga doesn't quite line up. This is more of a nitpick than anything. I just think it's fun noting the subtle differences. Still on the train, Shinozaki thinks more on her actions, with the panel showing that she really does feel terrible for what happened. Obviously, she doesn't have to say it, but it lends more credence to her desperation by making these things apparent. Arriving in the countryside, the game mostly focuses on the one interaction they have with the older woman. The manga mentions them visiting a number of different residents, and this questioning causes everyone to look at them with suspicion. Regardless, the girls eventually get the same ride from the truck driver. Unlike his game counterpart, the man doesn't make the pair uneasy, with the two leaving on friendlier terms. Fast forwarding to them finding the truck deserted, Shinozaki again notes the spiritual presence around them, urging them to find shelter. However, within a few panels, the girls immediately discover the strange building. There aren't any scenes of them getting lost in the woods, making the return trip infinitely smoother. Before going inside, the flashback of Hinoe discussing the Book of Shadows origin is shown. There's also an additional scene at the end, with the older sister telling her sibling that she'll keep her safe. While in the house, a few other changes take place in the manga. When Shinozaki checks the family registry in the game, she briefly hears dialogue from both Sachiko and her mother, presumably memories coming to life by the whims of their environment. Just before the final ritual starts, a family photo is shown with the husband's face scratched out, alluding to his existence being snuffed out as well. In the alternate version, the pictures are found first, though you do have the option to view these beforehand in the game. Similar dialogue is spoken from Sachiko, but we now see that Shinozaki has been possessed by a lingering spirit, saying those things as a result. A similar occurrence happens in one of the other game rooms, but again, this takes place away from the main route. The duel also acknowledges the shrine with the original charm, while the game leaves it as an optional discovery. A laughable change involves the vault, with Naomi getting the correct combination on her very first try. As they walk downstairs, Hinoe is shown getting a deadly premonition, concerned that something has happened 
happened to her sister. The events that follow are almost identical, except for one major change during the ritual. Rather than Mayu, the girls instead decide to try reviving Seiko. Unlike the first girl, this being has her face hidden, deceiving Naomi for a brief period. Calling back to their time together, it seems like she's accepting the feelings from Seiko's confession, until she defaults back to rekindling their friendship. Brought back to reality by Shinozaki, Naomi is forced to watch everything come crashing down. As the spell ends in failure, we now see exactly where the sharp objects come from. The victim also pulls them out of her body this time around, though it doesn't stop the death ceremony from continuing. This is where Hinoe makes her appearance, arriving just in time to protect her sister. Alluding to one of the earlier flashbacks, Shinozaki is amazed that the older sibling was able to save her. Unfortunately, the sacrifice remains the same, with Hinoe losing her head as a result. While there's a lot more context to her suddenly showing up, it still doesn't explain how she knew exactly where to go to find Shinozaki. That said, there's actually quite a bit more that happens in the manga. Naomi hears a voice telling them to evacuate, presumably coming from the lingering spirit of Hinoe. For whatever reason, the building starts to break down, not leaving the girls much time to escape. I'm not really sure how a ghost house can fall apart, but I'll just assume the Book of Shadows acted as a power source that kept everything intact. Watching her sister get dragged out of the basement, Hinoe apologizes, wishing the outcome could have been different. Leaving the tome behind, the students narrowly evacuate the building in time. Messing with things beyond their understanding, the girls are left to take in their new reality. With their hopes dashed, they have nothing to show for their efforts. The book is left buried in the small room, still amused by the carnage that it witnessed. Disappearing by the next page, it's unclear what happened to it. As a shadow appears nearby, it's hard to say if this person is the new owner, or if their goal is to become just that. One final bonus chapter takes place in the past, showing Shinozaki talking about her amazing sister while in class. Recalling her childhood, the girl is happy to have such a supportive sibling. Coming back to the present, Shinozaki is now in a hospital, recovering from the injuries she received at the estate. Blood Drive gives a brief recollection of these events, though only in text form. Regardless, this is where the story currently ends. While it mostly further develops what was already established in the first game, Book of Shadows makes for a pretty good time, especially if you're a visual novel fan. This is purely based on my own preference, but after playing it for myself, I would honestly place this on the same level as the opening entry. As Blood Cover does well introducing the general cast and lore, I think the style change in Book of Shadows does a great job expanding on both of those. Kizumi and Yoshiki were already favorites, but thanks to the extra story, I surprisingly became a fan of both Mayu and Morishige, as well as Naho and Sayaka. Without this entry, I never would have appreciated these individuals and what they bring to the series. The school also continues to be dangerous in the best way, adding some interesting new lore and showcasing plenty of brutal violence. The manga is a little rough in places, but overall, it contributes a lot to the experience as well. As far as I'm concerned, Book of Shadows is a worthy addition to the series, and I'm glad I decided to dig deeper. Effectively building on the previous foundation, these are the benefits that come with expanding horror. Special thanks to my awesome literary club members, Eldritch Flow, Ready! Ready.